last talk of today is by Professor Vladimiro Zapelgreski from Torino that uh, is a former member of the European Court of Human Rights. And the title of uh, his intervention is uh, Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, the Voice of Academies. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank the Academy for inviting me to speak on the topic of human rights and fundamental freedoms with particular reference to the role the academies can play in studying, defending, promoting, and first of all, understanding these kind of rights. In our times, we don't enjoy clear skies. Skies are gray, future is uncertain. Every measure that could possibly be used to defend one of humanity's greatest conquests a major conquest in particular for us, the Europeans, should now be promoted. I will organize my speech in two parts. Both of them will show important similarity and possible synergy for the academies and those who are engaged in the field of fundamental rights. I'm referring the first part to the universality as a character of human rights and of the attitude of the academies in carrying out uh, their studies. I will then say a few words on the possibility, I should say necessity, of overcoming the divide between the two cultures, humanities on one hand and sciences on the other. This new approach becomes more and more necessary in the field of law and human rights and the academies know how to make both cultures live and work together. Universality means no state borders. An intrinsic characteristic of human rights is their universality. It is certainly a tendential universality, think to the long and difficult history of women equality that admits variations, providing the essence is preserved. The idea of fundamental human rights postulates the unity of human nature and the inherent dignity of every human being. This is the common ground of the different philosophical approach of the human rights movement in France and in America, in Northern America. The secular philosophy of the Enlightenment in France and the religious one deriving from the Reformation in America. The one produced the Declaration of the Rights of Men and the Citizens, August 1789, and the other the Constitution of the State of Virginia and the American Declaration of Independence, both of 1776. The French Declaration proclaimed that the goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of men, adding following l'esprit des rois of Montesquieu that any society in which a guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the separation of powers determined, has no constitution. The American Declaration of Independence, mainly written by Jefferson, opens its preamble by saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that, no, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Self-evident, as Jefferson wrote, means that there is no external justification. Probably an explanation would have undermined the self-evidence of the claim and opened a difficult discussion about universality. Both the French and the American Declaration, notwithstanding the rhetorical emphasis, in practice concerned only the French and the American citizens. 
French and American governments and judges were competent to implement the rights and liberties of the declarations. The English Bill of Rights, 1689, is even more clear in defining its national scope, referring to the ancient rights and liberties of the English law deriving from English history. Coming to 1948, in 1948, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose Article 1 declares that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The echo of the French Declaration is clear. The United Nations Declaration continues by saying that uh, the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And the Declaration adds that it's essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. With the Universal Declaration, the two covenants on civil and political rights and on economic, social, and cultural rights in 1966 formed the International Bill of Human Rights. At European level, the Preamble of Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms considers that the aim of the Council of Europe is the achievement of greater unity between its members and that one of the methods by which that aim is to be pursued is the maintenance and further realization of human rights and fundamental freedom. One of the methods of the greater un uh, unity. And reaffirms that fundamental freedoms are the foundation of justice and peace in the world, best maintained on the one hand by an effective political democracy and on the others by a common understanding and observance of the human rights. Similar words repeated from 18th century to nowadays, but with a deep difference in legal meaning. Because meanwhile, the very idea of human rights evolved. After the Second World War, a radical modification of the concept of fundamental human rights was affirmed as a terrain of responsibility for the international community. Consequently, the principles of domestic jurisdiction and of non-interference in the internal affairs of states became no longer applicable. The philosophical and political movement that developed in Europe and America has thus acquired a new nature which fully recognizes the ownership of rights by each individual in as much as they are human beings. The wish in Europe was to adopt new measures to help to avoid wars in European continent. The link between violations of human rights and war has been underlined in all and every international documents on human rights. The Nuremberg trial gave the human rights movement an important impulse, justifying the position of those who indicated massive violation of human rights as one of the causes of the recent world war. Moreover, the Nuremberg trial was one of the basis of the new idea of the right and duty of the international community in the field of human rights. The United Nations Charter and organs were the most important international basis for the human rights movement to develop and bear fruits. The new position of the individual in international law has been the most important result. The equal position of the parties in front of the judges of the European Court of Human Rights hearings, the individual applicant and the state, is the clear sign of a revolution in the classical international law that only considered the states. The European system for the protection of individual fundamental rights 
thanks to the role played by European Court, is the most advanced in the world. The direct application by individuals to the European Court is a concrete sign of the ownership of rights and freedoms asserted against the state. I, I say against the state. Even the name of the cases is uh, uh, Rossi against Italy, against France. The court is external to those states. Indeed, European states recognize, not grant, the rights of the Convention. The current situation reveals that the fundamental rights are far from being everywhere fully realized, even in Europe. On the contrary, strong claims of specific differences, sometimes deep differences, are widespread. Thus, they speak of an, an Asian notion of rights, and there are African and Islamic charters. There is an Inter-American Convention of Fundamental Rights. And for us Europeans, the Convention on uh, Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, and for the European Union and the Member States, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the Union. All these documents, although they derive in some way from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, have a certain amount of specific content. All, however, are characterized by being applicable in certain areas, in certain regions of the world, regardless of the borders of the states and of the citizenships of the persons under their jurisdiction. This is, if you will, an aspect of the universality of fundamental rights, limited in their operative space, but nevertheless indifferent to the political borders of states and primarily concerned with human beings as such. The respect of the migrant's right is nowadays the best example of what that means. The origin of our academies also lies in 17th and 18th century Europe. Fundamental is the aspiration to the universality of knowledge, be it scientific or humanistic, with the consequent tendency to indifference or is it an intolerance, probably, towards state borders? The only concern was the rigor and laicism of the methods, the openness of educated dialogue and tolerance. It was the fertile ground on which the philosophy and the political battle of human rights could take root. For some time now, the explicit attack on the very idea of universality of fundamental rights even when only regional, has been evident. The call for the sovereignty of the states, the return of the demand of non-interference by other states and by supranational organizations, the reference to the identity, historical, cultural, and especially religious of the states is well advanced. The identity, self-assigned by those who see themselves as the majority of the citizens of the state, resents the different minority identities, urging nationalistic pride, calling for contrasts and conflicts. It also leads, in the field of human rights, to differentiation rather than harmonization. It operates according to the logic of us versus them. The network of European academies, academies can build a valid contrast to this tendency. It is their historical reason for being, while the reemergence of borders is a denial. Second part of my speech. Make the two cultures match and work together. I would like now to say a few words on the other reason why the role of academies may be important also in the field of human rights. It is evident that technological development, even more, ever more rapid and pervasive, produces profound changes in the structure of societies. 
and changes in the scope of people's fundamental rights and duties. The information society and the gathering and management of personal data have changed the significance of the right to respect for privacy and personal life. The sense of freedom of expression and the right to receive information has also changed. New genetics can question personal identity. New medical technologies have enriched the range of filiation possibilities and the right to respect for the family life that follows. The extension of these possibilities in these and other fields drives the analysis of the limits that is necessary to impose to new rights or new aspects of traditional rights and on the correspondent consequent new duties and responsibilities. The development of robots and the artificial intelligence in every field even raises the problem of ownership of rights and the attribution of duties. The use of algorithms in, in the field of justice and some examples of automatized justice raise a number of questions about fundamental rights, the rule of law, and fair trial. In the situation we are experiencing, the study of issue of human rights cannot be the monopoly of lawyers. The integration of the two cultures, scientific and humanistic, is essential. Academies could help overcome a long-standing distance and difficult dialogue where separated, specialized language doesn't help. An effective dialogue could be useful for both cultures. The one can fertilize the other. What is certain is that lawyers in general, and those who deal with human rights in particular, need to enrich their knowledge with access to at least some branches of the scientific culture. And it is unquestionable that hard sciences are not neutral and have to be aware of values they encounter. It is a matter of understanding each other and moving forward together. To conclude, in the field of human rights, the nature of the academies and the role they can play are particularly relevant because of their international scope and of the integration of knowledge they practice. The commitment of all available organizations and authorities, the academies among them, is urgent because we must stop the political regression on universality of human rights and help governing the technological revolution which is taking place. Thank you. Thank you.